One of the reasons why I was looking forward uh, to 2020 was back in 2016, then Secretary of Treasury Jacob Liu announced that we would have Harriet Tubman's face on the new $20 bill released in 2020. But this past summer, um, it was announced that due to concerns about counterfeiting, the new bill would not be introduced anytime soon. I was disappointed because I have always been an admirer of Harriet Tubman and thought of her as a moral example. However, as I was researching about her life, um, the more I discovered about her, the more I discovered she was also a great example of faith. We all know she did great things, courageous things, but she also shows us how faith in what God has done, is doing, and promises to do enables us to overcome our anxiety and our anger so that we can do great things for God. Harriet Tubman was born a slave in 19, uh, 1822 as Araminta Ross in Carolina County in Maryland. When she was a kid, uh, she suffered a traumatic head injury as one of the slave owners around her was throwing a two-pound metal weight at another slave and it missed him and it hit her on the head instead. She was knocked unconscious, bleeding profusely, and she was left to see if she would make it. She did make it. But she had chronic dizziness, pain, and fatigue. She was permanently disabled by that injury and would sometimes fall asleep and be unable to get herself to wake up. She never grew taller than five feet, and she was illiterate. She did not look like the part of a hero. And that is precisely why she was so good at being used by God to infiltrate enemy territory and lead thousands or hundreds of souls to freedom. Her life as a free woman began in 1849. She chose to run away then because instead of being freed as her previous owner promised, she and her family members were going to be split up and sold by the widow. So she ran away along with two of her brothers. After a short time while they were running away, they experienced unexpected hardships as places where they thought they would get help um, just turned on them. Because of their hopelessness, the two brothers gave up and returned to the plantation, but she decided to continue it alone. Miraculously, she evaded capture, found help, made it to Philadelphia. As she crossed into the free state Pennsylvania, she recalled, I looked at my hands to see if I was the same person. There was such a glory over everything. The sun came like a light through the trees and over the fields, and I felt like I was in heaven. She loved her freedom. She loved her life in Philadelphia. But the more she found to love about her freedom, the more she felt her father, her mother, her siblings, and her friends should also be free. So she took on odd jobs in Philly, saving money, and then went back down when she heard that her niece's family was about to be split up. She went down to Maryland. For the next 11 years, she took 13 trips to Maryland, rescuing 70 slaves, including babies, children, and the elderly. On her first trip, when she was rescuing her niece's family, there was a six-year-old and a three-month-old. And I was wondering, I wonder who was harder to take care of. The baby is totally helpless, but is a little bit lighter to carry. The six-year-old, how much did the six-year-old slow them down? Can you imagine running in the night and knowing that at any moment, the cry of armed men and the howl of dogs could come upon you? You are holding a child with your left hand, and you are reaching out in the darkness with your right. Your survival instinct is to just let go and run as fast as you can so that you will evade capture. But can you imagine fighting that instinct, slowing down to match the pace that the six-year-old can match, and smiling to encourage her as you desperately pray for God to help you to be hidden? That was Harriet's experience. Her life was distinctly Christian. She attempted great things for God, because she was convinced that God had given great promises to her. Everything she did was a response to what she believed about God. Her faith in God allowed her to overcome anxiety, and her faith in God allowed her to overcome anger. And that's the two ways in which I want to examine her life today. First, I want to consider her anxiety. I want you to understand what a crazy thing Harriet Tubman was doing. 
Um, by comparison, I want to share with you a crazy moment in my life. I was driving in the dark, uh, coming home from college, um, and I saw a hitchhiker on the road. And this was after midnight, and this was on a very quiet um, highway. And I passed by that person, and I thought, who is going to pick up that hitchhiker? That person is in so much trouble because it's a very dark piece of road, and there's very little chance that anybody will stop for that person. I was thinking, good luck, and I kept going. While I was thinking that, I felt God saying, why not you, Sam? Why not you? And I thought, because that would be crazy, God, because that person could kill me, God. That person could be crazy, God, was my thought. But I kept wrestling with it. If not me, then who? I don't know why this guy was walking on the street at midnight, but I thought there may be a reason for it. So I made a deal with God. God, I'll make a U-turn and I'll go back. If I happen to see him, and if he is still hitchhiking, then I will take it as a sign that perhaps you will be with me and protect me, and I will pick him up. So I loop around, and I come back again. And this guy, after about 20 minutes of this, and I was probably the only one on the street, is still walking like this the whole time. I was wondering, and I was curious, so I stopped to pick him up. He was visibly intoxicated, had recently broken up with his girlfriend, um, had stormed out of her house saying, I'm just going to go home then. And she was like, how are you going to get home? You don't even have your car. And he said, I'll find a way. And he was walking. And God had mercy on his soul. We had a good conversation. I took him to uh, the George Washington Bridge where he got on the bus and he said, yeah, I told her I'd do it. And I felt like I was, I don't know. I'm not sure if I was following my instinct on that one. Or if I was, you know, being a part of God's plan on that one, but, you know, that, that's how it was. My point is, um, even with uh, that small risk, I felt like I was doing something crazy and I had to battle a lot of my anxiety. I want you to understand what a crazy thing Harriet was trying to do. She wanted to go back to the land of her oppressor, to the land that enslaved her, and she experienced anxiety. First, consider her sickness. She was prone to falling asleep uncontrollably, a condition termed hypersomnia. She was often overtired, and even with this condition, she still signed up to swim through swamps, run through forests, and sneak past security. She was probably anxious that her body would betray her, that she would fall asleep, and the people there would not be able to rouse her. She was afraid that she could be captured. But she chose to overcome that anxiety and keep going. I'm also sure that she was anxious because she didn't have any role models. She was an illiterate, ex-slave woman trying to take people through the Underground Railroad to safety. None of the other people who worked in the Underground Railroad matched the description. Many of the leaders were black, but most of them were born free, they were well-educated, and almost all were men. She was the first female conductor on the Underground Railroad, and later she was the first female assault team leader in the U.S. Army. She ran spy missions for Northern generals during the Civil War and also led assault teams that attacked plantations in the South. Being the first of your kind in anything is always nerve-wracking. And of course, the field that she chose would be a field that any sane human being would be anxious about. Because running slave rescue missions in the South, the risks were extremely high. You never knew who would betray you. Harriet, she shared that she carried a pistol, and she described the time of having to use it on one of her fellow travelers, who wanted to go back to the plantation after morale got low. She pointed the gun at his head and said, you go on or die. Several days later, he was with the group as they entered Canada into freedom. That trip, that trip ended well, but imagine the stress that Harriet was under, knowing that at any moment it's not just the bounty hunters that could capture her, but people in her own party that might betray her. Any safe house that she went to, it would only take one person in that household to betray her for her to be tortured and executed. These constant and extreme risks were, I'm sure, a source of great anxiety. However, Harriet was not paralyzed by anxiety. The what-ifs did not get her. What if my body fails me? 
What if these people don't follow me? What if they betray me? Harriet overcame these what ifs with faith. Everything she did was based on what she believed about God. Consider today's passage, which in verse 3 calls us to remember those who are in prison as though you were in prison with them. Those who are being tortured as though you yourselves were being tortured. This is a tough command. How did Harriet find the strength to follow this command? The text also says in verse 6, The Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What can anyone do to me? The writer of Hebrews is pointing out that faith in what God has done for us will give us strength to do what God asks of us. God is with me. What can others do to me? I imagine Harriet saying, if they chase me, God will make me fast. If they come upon me, God will hide me. If they kill me, God will resurrect me. I can imagine her asking, what if to life? And everything the what ifs could throw at her, she has a response. Because of God, I can face this what if and overcome this anxiety. And moment by moment, she believed that God was talking to her. She was either really holy or really crazy. She thought that God was communicating with her in visions and sometimes with audible voice. She risked it all for God because she believed God was with her that intimately. The visions that started when her childhood head injury happened continued. And through that, Harriet believed God was giving her supernatural guidance. She believed in God. That was what made her able to overcome anxiety to do great things for God. And because she attempted great things for God, her obedience put her in positions where she was forced to put her absolute trust in God. And I believe that allowed her to experience God in visceral and miraculous ways that I cannot access. Her example challenges me. I wonder, because I am naturally skeptical, were her visions and dreams really from God? And I tend to think of them as perhaps hallucinations related to stress and to childhood injury. But I'm challenged, maybe. Maybe the reason why I don't experience dreams and visions and voices the way she does is because I don't obey God the way she does. And obedience doesn't put me in that position of vulnerability the way it puts her. And perhaps my lack of obedience keeps me from experiencing the fullness of the intimate leading that God wants to give to each of us. Her faith was real. She describes hurrying in the night, a night so dark that her party all had to hold hands as they were walking. When she was startled or scared by a sudden noise, she was able to keep holding on to the person relying on her because she had faith that God would not let go of her. Her faith in God made her able to keep faith with those that she rescued despite all the anxieties of the journey. Next, I want to talk about the greater challenge, I think. There is a challenge greater than the risks and the anxieties. And this is a challenge called anger. On one of her early trips back to Maryland, she was resolved to rescue her husband, John. She was born Araminta, and it was her husband, John, that named her Harriet. She loved John. She worked in Philadelphia doing odd jobs and saved enough money to buy John a nice suit so that he could have a disguise for the trip up north and they could go out relatively comfortably. However, when she got back to Maryland, she discovered that John had gotten remarried to a woman named Caroline. She was disappointed, but she was still willing to help John and Caroline escape to the north. She was willing to help their whole household escape. However, Caroline convinced John to stay in Maryland, and John repeatedly rejected Harriet's offer. Harriet was, as I'm sure you can imagine, angry. She was ready to storm that house and make a scene. But then she decided that he was not worth it. Suppressing her anger, she found some other slaves who were willing to escape, and she led them to Philadelphia. As for John and Caroline, they raised the family together and lived happily in Maryland for the next 16 years. 
The point I'm trying to share with you for the next 12 years, when Harriet Tubman is going down on rescue missions to Maryland, she is constantly drawing close to the home of John and Caroline, who are happily living there for all those years. Many, many times I'm sure she thought, why am I doing this when the people that I serve are obviously not worth it? When they are weak and when they're wicked and when they do not sacrifice for me, why would I do all this for them? Because certainly John was not unique in letting her down. Many of the people who followed her would also get demoralized when they were misconnections, unexpected hardships, unplanned getaways. Right when she was most stressed, they would add to our hardship by complaining and begging to be allowed to return to slavery. She was making great sacrifices for people who did not have great character. And that is a recipe for great anger. Perhaps she even grew angry at co-workers like Frederick Douglass, who experienced all the public praise while she did the tough work in the trenches. Frederick Douglass recognized this tension and wrote of her, The difference between us is very marked. Most of what I have done and suffered in the service of her cause has been in public. I have received much encouragement at every step of the way. You, on the other hand, have labored in a private way. I have wrought in the day, you in the night. The midnight sky and the sun and stars have been the only witnesses of your devotion to freedom. During the 13 years that she was rescuing slaves, Harriet had to do all of her work in secrecy because to be known would be to be disqualified from this task. Others would receive the praise and she would take on the most risk. That is an opportunity to get bitter and angry. And near the end of her life, she was even angry at Abraham Lincoln. She was frustrated that he took so long to sign the Emancipation Proclamation, and she was angry that he was reluctant to take decisive action on the cause of ending slavery. My point is that when we make great sacrifices, we are faced with constant great disappointments. This can cause us to become angry in ways that paralyze us. However, Harriet was not paralyzed by anger. The why bothers did not overcome her. Why bother when the people you are trying to help are weak and undeserving? Why bother when people who do much less than you get so much more praise than you? Why bother when the people in charge have no clue? As with anxiety, Harriet is able to overcome her anger, and she overcomes her anger through faith. Our passage implies that God does three things that makes it possible for us to overcome our anger. First, God promises to judge the wicked on our behalf. What allowed Harriet to walk away from her ex-husband instead of venting her rage at him? At least partly, it was her faith that God would, according to verse 4, judge the adulterer and fornicator. I'm sure that gave her a little bit of comfort as she did her trips back and forth. Her faith in God's justice allowed her to just give her anger to God. The second reason why she was able to overcome anger, God promises, God promises to receive our service. What allowed Harriet to keep serving when the people she was serving were cowardly, weak, even traitorous, It was her conviction that it wasn't just that God is making it, was not just empowering her service, but was receiving her sacrifice. Consider verse 2. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing that some have entertained angels without knowing it. This verse doesn't say that the strangers we serve will pay us back, or that the world will reward us for our good work. It doesn't tell us that the people whom we are sacrificing for will be worth our service. Instead, the passage says that our giving will be received by the angels of God in ways that we're not aware. The great secret to living a life of great sacrifice is that people aren't worth it, and that's okay. Isn't that the reason why we get so angry with our kids? We make great sacrifices 
and then we discover they are so totally not worth it. If you're going to be like this, why should I keep doing my best? You cook a meal, and the kid's like, I'm not going to eat it. If you're going to be like this, why should I care about your nutrition? In small ways, in big ways, we make sacrifice, and we're like, but they're not worth it. How do we keep going? God provides the reason for us to be able to continue to do our best as we serve folks who are at times weak and at times wicked. It's because in serving them, we are somehow serving angels without knowing it. This echoes Jesus' claim that whatever we did for one of these least brothers of his, we did for him. When your heart becomes bitter because no one seems to be worthy of your service, no one seems to appreciate all that you do, remember the promise. God makes your sacrifice meaningful by receiving that sacrifice onto himself. By sending angels into our midst without us knowing, God is restoring meaning and purpose to all of our sacrifice. So whether you are a teacher whose instructions are unheeded, or whether you are a medical professional surrounded by people who are trying to cheat the system in some way. No matter what you are surrounded by, do not let the unworthiness of the people you serve keep you from finding meaning because God is receiving all of our sacrifice. Finally, Harriet has a reason to serve under imperfect leaders. Consider verse 7 and 8. Remember your leaders those who spoke the word of God to you, consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. The way I interpret these verses, um, I'm not sure if it's legit. So let me just explain my perspective with you. It says, remember your leaders, those who in the past spoke the word of God to you because in the present, it's my assumption that they're saying something shady or they're saying something uninspiring. And I think about myself. Sometimes I'm with people and I'm thinking, wow, I must stumble their faith so much because the things that come out of my mouth in retrospect are pretty uninspiring and selfish and weak. What does it tell people when they are frustrated by having to follow me, I think it's saying, remember your leaders. The one who at some point, didn't he speak the word of God to us? I know there was a bunch of weak and irrelevant and shady and just immature things that he said, but at some point in his life, didn't he speak the word of God to us? And, and I think that what God is saying to us, when we think about our leaders, try to find that one instance in which God was actually using them. And remembering that, try to overlook all the other things that gets in the way. And we're able to be generous to our leaders like that, remembering them by their best moments, their most connected to God moments. We're able to do that because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. As a result, when it's only that Pastor Sam's one sermon that one time was inspiring, even though he was not the same in the way he lived in the moments that followed, because Jesus is the same throughout history, let us serve the leaders that we have. Because perhaps that's all God had to give us. I'm sorry. Sinful leaders will be wicked and weak, but God encourages Harriet to remember them by their best moments. Even though they're imperfect, isn't God still using them? Aren't they yet people of faith? And because Jesus Christ is worthy and perfect yesterday and is so today and will be tomorrow, God calls Harriet to see the best in their imperfect leaders. And therefore, faith in God allows her to overcome anger and have faith despite imperfect leadership. A close study of Harriet Tubman's life reveals that her work is inspired and sustained by her faith. And that's the way life must be for you and for me. Let's begin our personal application with verse 1. This is the easiest, this is the tamest, most ordinary of the commands given. Verse 1, let mutual love continue. Can we read that together? Let mutual love continue. Compared to remembering those who are in prison or rescuing those who are tortured, isn't let mutual love continue something that seems quite doable? It's like, just 
Pass it on. Someone is nice to you, just pass it on. You think that's natural. I can do that, you think. And then you look at yourself and you're like, I don't want to do even that. Mutual love, we discover, is not natural because naturally our hearts are so selfish and so ungrateful that the call to love those who have loved us feels like a burden. When our parents who have loved us call on us, it feels like a burden. This tendency becomes even more visible when we think less individually and more as a group. Westminster Church of Detroit housed KPCMD in its basement when the Korean church started all those decades ago. So remembering how they were loved, members of KPCMD decided to go cook lunch on the first Saturday of every month to help Westminster Church feed their neighbors in need. It's a small act of love and solidarity with a church that showed love and solidarity to them a generation ago. But that was a generation ago. That was a long time ago and mutual love feels burdensome now. I was talking to some of the organizers. And they mentioned how hard it is to find volunteers to come and share and serve. I'm fond of remembering that the missionary monk Alopen of the Syrian church arrived in China in the year 685 AD, making inroads for Christianity into China 600 years before Marco Polo. Let me repeat that. A guy named Alopen, a guy who lived in Syria, was a monk there, decided, I'm going to take the gospel that direction. He just went east, went through India, preached there, and went all the way towards China. Because the first missionaries to Korea were Catholic and came by way of China, I, as a Korean, owe a debt to both the Chinese church and the Chinese church's um, intercessor, the, the Syrian church. If we keep, keep our history in mind, we should wonder if there's something we can do for the Syrian refugees who are being resettled in our counties. More Syrian refugees have been resettled in Michigan than in any other state besides California. And we're like neck and neck with California in terms of Syrian refugee resettlement. We can wonder, how can we help those, those people? How can we support the churches that are supporting them? We could also ask how we can partner with aging Chinese churches in decline in our towns. I'm not saying that we have to do all of these things. My point is that we, by nature, are reluctant and afraid to do any of these things. We will find reasons to be anxious and we will find excuses to get angry. There's much to be anxious about. What if I don't have the margin to take care of both them and me? What if it feels awkward to go and do something new? What if this is something no other church has succeeded in doing before? What if it's dangerous? It is right to consider, pray through, and discuss all these worries, but we are so paralyzed by our anxieties that we don't even get around to articulating these ideas even to ourselves. When was the last time that you were thinking, hmm, I wonder how I could show mutual love? Do not our anxieties crowd out that possibility. But let's say that we found the courage and the energy and the unity to overcome our anxiety and begin to pray about, talk about, and brainstorm some ministry that allows us to show love to they who showed love to us. Even when we come up with a clear cause, even when we overcome anxiety and begin to take some action, we will quickly discover many reasons to get angry. And in our anger, we will quietly give up. If we were to show up at Westminster Church, where we started ministering to the Syrian refugees in Dearborn, we would quickly discover that we're experiencing microaggressions, suspicion, a little bit of racism, and we would feel that we're treated unfairly. This anger would be on top of the annoyance stemming from the fact that we believe we're doing more work and receiving less praise than the other volunteer next to us. And perhaps that anger and annoyance would be combined with the frustration that comes from complaining about the lack of coherent strategy and vision on the part of the leaders. That Pastor Sam doesn't even know what he's doing. Anger upon anger upon anger. And you will probably not mutiny you'll just quietly not show up the following week. 
opportunities for anxiety and anger abound because your leader, your peers, and the people you serve are all wicked and weak. It is the state of humanity. It is therefore hard to even let mutual love continue. What then is our hope? That we will not drop the ball. What is the reason that we can believe we will in fact continue to do love? Our hope is only in faith in God. It is only by believing that God is at work in our midst. God is already at work. Somebody will have to testify, God received my sacrifice and that makes it worth it. Mothers, is it the Mother's Day card or the breakfast that kids bring that makes it all worthwhile? Is it the kids? It is not. It is somehow mysteriously that we experience God as we serve and give of ourselves. Teachers, is it that you are inspired by the kids or is it that you serve despite the kids sometimes? Is it not that we are humbled because God is showing us that he has shown up receiving the service that we provide? When we go on a short-term mission trip, I believe that we don't, we, we might go thinking that we're going to take Christ to some God-forsaken place. But when we come back, what do we do? We say we were blessed. Why? Because we found that God was already there. And he was there to greet us. He was there to encourage us. He was there to receive our service. And he was so gracious to us that our awkward service was something he honored and received. And because he was worthy of our all, the sacrifice in the mission field was joy. And it will not just be on the mission field on those short-term trips. It will be right here in our community. I was depressed and my heart was heavy with anxiety and anger at church. I didn't know why exactly. I just wanted to disappear at least for a while. Isn't that a description of every member of church at least three months out of the year? Yes. But God called me to pray. God called me to extend peace. God called me to love. And now God has overcome my anxiety and anger and I have hope and I have joy here at church again. I'm not as tired as I used to be. I am fully aware of the fact that we are a group of imperfect sinners constantly failing to love each other. But I am also aware that God is in our midst receiving our service, challenging us when we're wrong, promising to never leave us or forsake us. Because of this, even though the storm may last for a night, joy will come in the morning. Because of this, we will not be overcome. We will rise as a church, undergirded by great faith as we attempt great things for God. We will declare, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid for what can anyone do to me. Believing in God dedicating ourselves to obey him, one humble act of hospitality at a time. Let us pray. God, we declare that our confidence is in you. We declare that everything we do, we do with faith in you. So would you help us to push past our anxiety and to lay down our anger so that we can live our lives in humble obedience to you who are receiving our service even when we do not realize it. These things we pray in Christ's name.